let's start. Um, as usual, we'll start with some prayers and some meditation before we get into the class, the material for tonight. <clears throat> <clears throat> so again, while reciting the prayers, try to have the image of Shakyamuni Buddha in the space in front of you. Just do the best you can to visualize the Buddha. Don't worry about having a perfect, clear, detailed visualization, but everyone has different abilities when it comes to visualizing. So be happy with whatever you are able to do. I always think the important thing is to try to feel the Buddha is there. As Lama Zopa Rinpoche says, we're never alone. Wherever we are all the time, there are many, many Buddhas and Bodhisattvas around us, just ready to help us. So it's, it's really helpful to feel that feel that the Buddha is always there. <clears throat> and it's just up to us to turn our mind to the Buddha, open our heart to the Buddha, be ready to receive blessings, inspiration, guidance, help. And you may also find it helpful to think of all mother sentient beings sitting around you, <clears throat> wishing that they too could open their hearts and their minds to the Buddha and his incredible compassion, love, wisdom, all these excellent qualities that he has, all the wonderful teachings he has to share with us. <clears throat> so wouldn't it be wonderful if all living beings could share in this experience? So you can imagine them there around you as well. So then we'll recite the prayers of taking refuge, generating bodhicitta, the four immeasurables, and so on. And you can imagine all the sentient beings doing these prayers along with us. <clears throat> I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly by my practice of giving and other perfections. May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negativities accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence and turn the wheel of dharma for living beings. 
And I dedicate my own merits and those of all others to the great enlightenment. <clears throat> this ground anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with milk meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Niryatayami. So while we recite the mantra of the Buddha, we'll do it seven times. You can imagine light flowing from the Buddha, and the light represents all the Buddha's qualities, his knowledge and realizations and his excellent qualities, in the form of light. And imagine this filling yourself, and you can also think of it going to all the sentient beings around us. Imagine all our bodies and minds totally suffused with this light. And it purifies all negative energy, physical and mental. So that can include sickness, and any other kind of physical difficulties you may have, as well as our afflictions and karma, negative karma, the cause of suffering. So imagine all these things getting purified, disappearing. And the light also nourishes our positive potential, our good qualities like compassion, love, wisdom, so that they can grow, become stronger, greater, more pure, and help us get closer and closer to the state of enlightenment, just like the Buddha. Taya <clears> ta <throat> om mune mune Maha Manaye Soha Taya Ta Om Mune Mune Maha Manaye Soha Taya Ta Om Mune Mune Maha Manaye Soha Taya ta om mune mune maha mune soha. Taya ta om mune mune maha mune soha. Taya ta om mune. <clears throat> so take a few moments to make sure your mind is settled down in the here and now, clear of thoughts about the past or the future or other things not related to what we're doing here. So you can watch the breath, be aware of the breathing coming in and going out for a few minutes. That's a really good way of settling down. And then we'll do a meditation on the development of bodhicitta, the altruistic intention. <clears throat>
So we've been going through the points of the meditation called equalizing and exchanging self for others. This is one of the main methods for developing bodhicitta. And the last couple of weeks, we meditated on the, the faults or the shortcomings of self-centeredness, selfishness. And tonight we'll move on to the next point, which is meditating on the um, advantages, the benefits of the opposite attitude, which is cherishing others or altruism. So there's one um, saying that is in the teachings, like in the Lam Rem, that um, even though we ourselves and the Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, have been in samsara from beginningless time, but the Buddha already got out of samsara a long time ago. And not only did he get out of samsara, but he reached the state of full enlightenment, Buddhahood. So he did that long ago, and yet we are still in samsara, circling in samsara, dying and taking rebirth and over and over and over again. So why is that? How come he got out of samsara and we're still in it? And so the answer is because the Buddha decided to stop being self-centered, stop indulging in the self-centered attitude. I mean, he, he, he once had it too. He was once self-centered, but he decided, no, I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to stop being that way. And instead, I'm going to cherish others. And so he worked really hard to bring about that transformation in his mind and train his mind to be more concerned about others and less concerned about self. And that enabled him to follow the Bodhisattva's path and attain enlightenment. And so if, if we feel inspired by the Buddha's example, then this is what we need to do as well. We need to make that kind of switch, kind of change in our mind. But we shouldn't do this with a sense of being forced or being pushed. You know, like, oh, I don't really want to do this, but my teacher tells me I have to do it. So, you know, we do it with great reluctance. So that's not the right attitude. Instead, we, we need to want to bring about this change in our mind coming from a recognition that it is a better state of mind. Cherishing others is far better than cherishing ourselves. And so that's the best attitude to have, to really see for ourselves that it's better to cherish others than to cherish ourselves and then want to make that change in our mind. Okay, so let's um, contemplate some of the benefits of cherishing others. <clears throat> so in the Buddhist teachings, it is said again and again that cherishing others, caring for others with compassion and love is the source of all good and happiness. So we need to check to see if this is really the case or not. So one thing that is helpful is to think about just things that happen in the world, either you know the whole world globally, or even just in our own community, our own city or town or um, the community of people we know and we're involved with. So, so bring to mind some actions that were done by people out of kindness and compassion. 
So there's actually lots of these happening every day, even if they're not reported on the news. The news usually reports all the awful things that happen. Doesn't say much about the good things, but there are lots and lots of good things every single day, every single minute. There are, for example, doctors and nurses and psychologists and social workers who are really working hard to take care of people who have problems, um, sickness, injuries, um, emotional problems, mental problems, addiction problems. So there's lots of that going on everywhere in your own community and in communities and cities all around the world. So just contemplate that and understand that these kind of actions are done with an attitude of kindness, caring for others, cherishing others, and just try to recognize how beneficial those actions are. <clears throat> And there are lots of organizations working very hard to relieve suffering. Just some of the more famous ones are like UNICEF, Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders, the World Central Kitchen that's providing meals, millions of meals to people who are hungry and in difficulties like in Ukraine. So those are the famous organizations, but there's lots of others that are smaller, but they're still working very, very hard collecting donations and then using those donations um, to bring medical help, to bring food and clothes and shelter and relieving the suffering of sentient beings, of human beings and also animals. So just think about those kind of actions that are happening again every single day, every minute, somewhere in the world, those kind of actions are being done. So try to recognize how fantastic it is that there are people acting with altruism, with this attitude of cherishing others. And it could also be helpful to think about what the world would be like if people didn't have that kind of attitude of caring for others, um, recognizing the suffering of others and being compassionate and wanting to relieve that, that suffering and you know, putting their time and energy and their money into doing that. So what would the world be like if, if there wasn't such compassionate, altruistic actions taking place? <clears throat>
bring to mind an act of kindness, an act of compassion that you yourself have done recently or further back in time. Maybe you noticed somebody who was in need of help and you stepped up and offered your help to that person. Even if it was just something small and simple like helping someone find directions to where they were trying to go, or helping somebody carry a heavy bag. Bring that experience to mind and just think about how that, how that action affected the other person and also how it affected yourself. So now see if you can come to a conclusion about what you understood, what you realized from this meditation about this attitude of cherishing others, being less self-centered, more concerned for others. If you can recognize that that is a more beneficial attitude than self-centeredness, then see if you can make the determination to work on that, work on increasing that attitude and decreasing self-centeredness. <clears throat> okay, so um, again, I've made some slides, if they could be put up. So the first slide is um, a response to a question that came up at the end of last class. We had been talking about uh, the bodhisattvas and how the bodhisattvas want to avoid the extreme of cyclic existence. And that phrase, the extreme of cyclic existence, means uh, being in cyclic existence under the control of afflictions and karma. You know, having to die and be reborn again and again in cyclic existence. Uh, through the force of karma and afflictions. So the bodhisattvas want to avoid that. And they do so by um, realizing the selflessness of persons. But they don't want to be, get out of samsara in the sense that they want to stay in samsara to be able to help sentient beings. 
Um, so anyway, that was that was what we were talking about. And then at the end of the class, um, oh yeah, and another thing too, we've been talking about for the for the previous couple of weeks was how um, uh, bodhisattvas need to know the paths of all the vehicles, not just their own bodhisattva vehicle, but they also have to know the paths of the hearers and also the solitary realizers, because their goal is to become a Buddha, fully enlightened Buddha, um, who will help all sentient beings to attain their respective goals. And since there are sentient beings who, who have the inclination to follow the hearer's path and attain the hearer's enlightenment, as a Buddha, you need to know how to guide them. So you need to know those paths to be able to guide others on those paths. And so um, the main realization of hearers, the main path of hearers is selflessness of persons. Um, the wisdom realizing that there's no self-sufficient, substantially existent person. So Bodhisattva needs to meditate on that as well to be able to help hearers in their uh, spiritual progress towards their goal. And so then at the end of the class, Stephen, Stephen here <laughs> um, asked if, if a bodhisattva only needs to know uh, objects like that, like the selflessness of persons, to be able to help others, or do they also need to know it for their own sake, for their own uh, spiritual development? So I said I would look for an answer to that. And after, after the class, I did remember that this came up when, when I was studying the ornament with our teacher, Geshe Tanbel. And um, I remember very clearly that he said um, to, to be able to realize emptiness, like emptiness of true existence, that's the main object of meditation of bodhisattvas. That's the main thing bodhisattvas focus on. But that's quite a subtle object. And before you can realize emptiness of, in, of true existence, you need to realize selflessness of persons and also impermanence, subtle impermanence. And so I pulled out, I found a quotation from my, from my notes or from the transcript of, of our teachings. And so in this particular place, um, he was, Geshe Tempa was talking about the order of generating realizations. Um, first, he said, be, you know, you have to first have a conceptual realization of something like impermanence or selflessness before you can attain the direct realization. So that's something we know, we've heard that before. You can't just immediately go to a direct realization. You have to first start with a conceptual realization and then keep meditating on that. And eventually it becomes a direct realization. And so then he's, he talked about the order in which you generate realizations. And so this is on, on the slide here. Uh, first, one needs to generate a conceptual realization of impermanence. That means subtle impermanence, the momentary change, changing nature of things. Then of selflessness, meaning selflessness of persons, um, the absence of a self-sufficient, substantially existent person. And then of emptiness, emptiness of true existence. So that's the order in which you develop those realizations on the conceptual level. And, and then here's an actual quote from him. He kind of explains why that is. <laughs> he says, without realizing impermanence, there is no way all the objects of negation involved in realizing selflessness of persons can be refuted. So to realize selflessness of persons, we have to refute, we have to first identify this false kind of self or I or person, the self-sufficient substantially existent one. We have to recognize that. And then we have to use reasoning to refute it, to realize 
that such a self is impossible. It can't possibly exist. So we have to go through that process of refutation or negating uh, the false sense of self. So he says to be able to do that with selflessness of persons, we have to first realize impermanence, subtle impermanence, the permanent, the changing nature of things. Then he goes on to say, and without realizing selflessness of persons, there's no way all objects of negation that need to be refuted in order to realize emptiness of true existence can be refuted. So again, emptiness of true existence is a more subtle um, object to realize. And also, it also involves going through a process of, of uh, recognizing the object to be negated, and then using reasoning to prove to yourself that that kind of phenomena is impossible. True existence is, is simply impossible. It can't exist. Okay. So anyway, this is just a quote from a teacher, the Rampa Geshe, um, about how, yeah, to be able to realize emptiness of true existence, we need to first have a realization of selflessness of persons. And before we realize that, we have to have a realization of impermanence, subtle impermanence. So this is quite important. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm always surprised how in the Lam Rim, for example, uh, even the great Lam Rim, the great exposition of the stages of the path by Lama Tsongkhapa, which I think is the biggest Lam Rim there is, the most extensive detailed Lam Rim there is, um, there's just brief mention of subtle impermanence, but no instructions on how to meditate on it. <laughs> yeah, no guidance on how to meditate and, and realize subtle impermanence. And the same with selflessness of persons. It's mentioned, but not in the sense of how to meditate on it. So I always found that quite puzzling, <laughs> but it could be because um, in the monasteries, the monks and nuns studying in the monasteries, they study for 10, 15, 20, 25 years. And in their studies, they study texts and they do debating. They, they do a lot of debating on topics like subtle impermanence and also selflessness of persons. And so in the process of their study and debate, perhaps at that time, they are able to learn about these topics, meditate on them, and even gain a realization of them. And then they're ready to um, go on to emptiness, which is a much more subtle topic. Um, but for those of us, you know, most, most Westerners don't go through the Geshe study program. Um, and our main, um, the main subject that we learn about and meditate on is the Lam Rim. So then, yeah, I guess we just have to find other ways to learn about things like subtle impermanence and selflessness of persons. <clears throat> but I also noticed in um, um, <clears throat> one of the volumes of the Library of uh, Wisdom and Compassion, it's volume four, which I think is called Following the Buddha's Footsteps. Yeah. Um, in that volume, there's a very extensive explanation of the four foundations of mindfulness, four foundations, and the, and the four foundations of mindfulness is one method for understanding and realizing subtle impermanence, as well as selflessness of persons, and, um, and it's mainly practiced in the Theravada tradition. It's, it's one of the most important meditation practices in the Theravada tradition. Um, and it's supposed to be practiced also by bodhisattvas. <laughs> bodhisattvas are supposed to practice it too. But in the book, the Dalai Lama kind of laments that um, not many people in the Tibetan tradition do that, that kind of practice. But he says we should. Yeah, it is a practice that we should do. And I, my plan is in the next course, um, um, when this course finishes, then in September, September, October, November, in that course, um, which will be on chapter four of the ornament, 
of, I will go into these four foundations of mindfulness and how to meditate on them. They're very, very important and very useful as well. Very, very practical. So is that okay? You happy? <laughs> Any questions about that? <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so then the, just a few other things that are related to what we talked about last time. Um, so this again in, in relation to bodhisattvas and how bodhisattvas um, remain in cyclic existence. Well, uh, specifically Arya bodhisattvas. Arya bodhisattvas. Um, remain in cyclic existence, but not under the control of karma and afflictions. So how do they do it? <laughs> um, so there's this topic of mental bodies, a mental body. I never even heard of such a thing before I studied the ornament. Um, so for me, it was quite, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I like to share it with other people as well. I don't think you find it in the long room. Um, so let's, let's remind ourselves of our, ourselves and other ordinary beings and, um, how we are in samsara. Um, so we take rebirth in samsara as a result of, uh, karma and afflictions. So like, I'm sure you've all heard the explanation of the 12 links, so the first link, ignorance, that leads us to create karma. And karma, karmic actions that are complete with all the four factors, complete, like a complete karmic action, is powerful enough to cause rebirth. And so every time we create one of those karmic actions, it leaves a seed on our mind that has the potential to throw us into another life, another rebirth. And then when we come to the end of our life, uh, because of our familiarity with attachment and craving and grasping, those uh, mental factors arise and they have the function of kind of nourishing one of our karmic seeds, one of those karmic seeds for rebirth. And then that becomes powerful enough to uh, throw us into another life, another rebirth. And so those are the main factors, ignorance, karma, and then craving and grasping. Those are the main factors that cause us to take rebirth again and again in samsara. And um, so bodhisattvas on the first two paths, the path of accumulation and the path of preparation, also take rebirth uh, due to karma and afflictions. So they're not yet free of that, but um, probably they take good rebirths because they've been working on themselves for a long, long time and creating a huge amount of virtue and purifying their non-virtue. And so the rebirths they take are most probably good ones, fortunate ones, but still they're not free of this, the forces of karma and afflictions. Um, and also... The, they, they are creating new karma, okay? They're, they're still creating karma, but again, it would be mostly virtuous karma. Very likely they'd be creating non-virtuous karma. They would be creating virtuous karma, but it's still contaminated karma. So contaminated karma means karma created under the, under the influence of ignorance, mainly ignorance and other afflictions. So you cannot start creating uncontaminated karma until you become an Arya, until you attain the path of seeing. And so bodhisattvas on those first two paths, they're still in samsara and taking rebirth in samsara, not with full control, but under the force of karma and afflictions. And they still have ordinary bodies that uh, are the result of karma and afflictions and their bodies experience pain and sickness and so forth. But then when a bodhisattva attains the path of seeing, 
um, that's the point where they gain the first direct realization of emptiness. At that time, they attain what's called a mental body. And the term in Tibetan is literally a body of the nature of mind. Although that doesn't mean it is mine, it doesn't mean you have a body that is mine, but that term is used because it's kind of a subtle body, not a, a gross body like ours. And so this mental body is uncontaminated because the causes of the mental body um, are uncontaminated. So the actual causes, let me see where it says. So, so what happens is, you know, before they attain the path of seeing, they still have a gross physical body, an ordinary body that's contaminated, but then it transforms <laughs> that, that very body. It doesn't like it dies and then you get a new body. It transforms into this mental body. And um, the reason or the, yeah, the reason why it's able to transform is because of their bodhicitta, both their conventional bodhicitta, their incredible, you know, dedication to help all sinny beings, and also their ultimate bodhicitta, which is the, the wisdom directly realizing emptiness that's conjoined with conventional bodhicitta. So the power of those states of mind enables their body to make this transformation. And so the mental body isn't made of matter like bones and flesh and so on. It's a bit like a bardo body. You know, you've heard about the bardo body, which, um, well, we all have, <laughs> we've all taken bardo bodies in between one life and the next. And it's said to be a sort of subtle body that can pass through walls and yeah, very different than the kind of body we have now. And then the third bullet point says it arises from two causes. So there's two causes of the mental, bo mental body. One is uncontaminated karma. So uncontaminated karma is created by somebody who has attained the path of seeing, who is an Arya being by gaining the direct realization of emptiness. So someone who has that wisdom, that realization in their mind is able to create uncontaminated karma. So that's one of the causes for the mental body. And the other one, I don't really understand this one, but this is what it said. <laughs> we tried to ask our teacher about it, but we didn't get a very clear answer. It's um, subtle exertion motivated by knowledge obscurations. Um, and remember, according to this school, this Fatantrika school, um, knowledge obscurations or cognitive obscurations, obscurations to omniscience, um, mainly consist of the, um, the ignorance grasping a true existence. So that ignorant mind grasping a true existence, that's the main knowledge obscuration. And I would think that imprints, the imprints, the latencies of that ignorance as well would be included in knowledge obscurations. But I don't know more about that second cause. That's just what it says in the text. Anyway, those are the causes for the mental body. Um, and then the next point says it's free of physical suffering like sickness and pain but not free of pervasive compounded suffering. And so what our teachers said is that, um, you know, Bodhisattva has this kind of mental body, um, but it still looks like an ordinary body. And, and, and they will show the aspect of, you know, getting sick, getting old, dying and so on. But in fact, they don't have the, um, the suffering that normally accompanies those kinds of experiences. Now, yeah, but now they say from the path of seeing onwards, bodhisattvas no longer have physical pain, physical suffering. But because they're not yet free of samsara uh, until they become uh, Buddhas, then they're not free of pervasive compounded suffering. So the third type of suffering 
which afflicts all beings in samsara. They're not yet free of that. So, so that's the kind of body that bodhisattvas have from the path of seeing on. And so um, when they take birth, they have this mental body. And um, it's also said that they take birth not due to karma and afflictions, but due to the power of compassion and prayer or aspiration. So they make strong prayers, even to be born in unfortunate situations like hell or hungry ghost realm and so on, to be able to help the beings there. So it's the power of their compassion and prayer that um, enable them to take rebirth within samsara. I just, I, I don't fully understand all of this explanation. <laughs> I'm just sharing it with you. I find it quite extraordinary. Um, there is some more explanation about this in um, volume six of the Library of Wisdom and Compassion, which is, I think, called Com Courageous Compassion, isn't it? Courageous Compassion. Yeah, um, page 329. It's pretty for, far back in the book. Uh, about bodhisattvas in samsara. However, that explanation is based on the prasangika view, uh, which has a different explanation of knowledge obscurations. What are knowledge obscurations? So there's you know, a little difference between that and what the Svatantrika say. But still, it gives more information about uh, mental bodies and bodhisattvas taking birth due to prayer and compassion. And then the last bullet point says, arhats, so this is like here in solitary realizers, when they reach their goal of enlightenment and become arhats. So they also attain a mental body when they attain nirvana without remainder, which means when they die. <laughs> so when they come to the end of their life and die, um, so the, the present aggregates they have cease to exist and then they take a mental body, they have a mental body and, that's, and this mental body abides in Sukhavadi, pure land, <clears throat> Amitabha's pure land. But I think for the Arhats, since they're Arhats, their mental bodies would be free of pervasive compounded suffering because they are free of samsara. So they would be free of all types of suffering. Anyway, I thought that might be interesting for you. Sounds a little bit like science fiction or fantasy, but <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> okay, then just to kind of wrap up um, what we've been talking about, this is kind of, something we looked at in the very first class when I was giving the overview of the ornament of clear realizations and the eight main uh, subjects, which are sometimes called eight clear realizations or eight categories. And um, so, so there was this way of dividing them into groups and um, so far we've finished the, the first three of the eight categories, the first three clear realizations. Now we're about to move on to the fourth. So I thought it might be helpful to look at this again. So of the eight categories or eight clear realizations, the first three are, are said to be objects to be cultivated. They're actually minds. <laughs> when it says object, we shouldn't think of it like a physical object, but a thing to be cultivated. They're actually minds, they're actually states of mind, realizations that are to be cultivated by bodhisattvas. So those again are the exalted knower of all aspects, which is enlightenment, Buddha's mind. And then knower of paths, um, uh, which is a bodhisattva's realization. Um, knowing all the different paths of the three vehicles to be able to help uh, 
practitioners of those vehicles. And then knower of bases, the one we just looked at. So those are called the three exalted knowers. And um, these are to be cultivated by mainly by bodhisattvas, because this text, the ornament for clear realizations, is written for bodhisattvas, showing bodhisattvas or aspiring bodhisattvas, those who want to be bodhisattvas and follow the bodhisattva path. These are the things you need to do. <clears throat> um, and then, so those are the three things to be cultivated. And then, um, then the, the next four categories are the means for attaining them. So these are the means or the methods for attaining those three exalted knowers. And these are all called applications, application in complete aspects, peak applications, serial application, instantaneous applications. So we're going to start looking at those now. And again, an application is a practice. It's not like an app on your phone or your iPad. It's, it's a mental state, um, a mental practice, a yoga. So hopefully that'll get more clear as we go along. So those are the four ways that a bodhisattva practices to attain the three exalted knowers. And then the eighth, the last one is the final result, result in truth body. This is the equivalent of Buddhahood, the enlightened state. And that's the subject matter of the eighth chapter, the last chapter. Um, yeah, so then just one more um, slide about what we've been looking at. Um, <clears throat> something that is said in the text that all Arya's clear realizations are included in the three exalted knowers. So all Arya's, there are four kinds of Arya's, hearer Arya's, solitary realizer Arya's, Bodhisattva Aryas and Buddha Aryas. So those four kinds of Aryas. And again, an Arya is someone who's at least gained the direct realization of emptiness and well, possibly beyond that as well. So all clear realizations of Aryas are included in the three exalted knowers. So all the clear realizations of hearers and solitary realizers are included in knower of bases. So all their realizations of knower bases, but um, knower bases is also in the minds of bodhisattvas and Buddha's aryas. So they have knower bases as well. It's not ex um, restricted to hearers and solitary realizers, but knower bases are like objects that they all have in common. For example, selflessness of persons. Everybody has to meditate on selflessness of persons. That's the main object of meditation for hearers, the main thing they meditate on. Bodhisattvas have to meditate on it as well, and so do Buddhas. So they all have that realization. Um, that's an example of knower bases. And then secondly, all the clear realizations of bodhisattvas are included in knower paths. So knower paths isn't something in the mind of a hearer or a solitary realizer. It's only in the mind of a Mahayana Arya, so bodhisattvas and Buddhas. Um, but whatever realizations bodhisattvas have would all be included in that type of knower, knower of paths. And then all clear realizations of Buddhas are included in exalted knower of all aspects. So an exalted knower of all aspects is only found in the mind of a Buddha, not in a bodhisattva or a hearer or a solitary realizer. So it's exclusive to Buddhas. So every clear realization that a Buddha has would be an exalted knower of all aspects. So those are the things we've been looking at up to now, kind of roughly, not going into all the details, but just to get some idea of those three. And so now we'll move on to chapter four. If there's any questions, anything you don't understand or you want to ask about, 
before we move on. It's very venerable. Frog and huh? uh, There is a question in the chat regarding, it just says settle in permanence question mark. <laughs> That's from David. If David would like to ask a little bit more specific. <laughs> David, you can unmute. Uh, yes. Uh, on something, sorry. Go ahead, David. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry for, for not um, I had permanence. So subtle and permanence sounds intimidating. Thank you. Sounds intimidating. intimidating. Mm -hmm. It sounds intimidating. Well, subtle impermanence simply means um, uh, certain phenomena, like all physical phenomena, all material things, as well as mind, consciousness. Uh, so th those kind of phenomena are impermanent phenomena. And the meaning of subtle impermanence is that they don't stay the same from one moment to the next. They're constantly changing. Um, it might be helpful to think about physics. Little, the little I know about physics is that, you know, on a very subtle level, when you divide up a material phenomena into its components and you get down to, you know, the tiniest particles, um, my understanding is they don't stay the same. They're not like solid and static and unmoving and unchanging, but there's constant change taking place. Um, that's just their nature. That's just how things are. And, you know, long before there was even a word physics, the Buddha knew about this. He was able to see this subtle changing nature of things with his mind with his you know incredible mind um so he could see it happening and we can too if we develop our minds we can also gain that uh insight that wisdom that sees that for example a table even though it looks solid and it looks like it stays the same doesn't change much but it's constantly changing on a very subtle level so the same is true with our bodies and all the physical things in the world, and also our minds. Our minds are also constantly changing. So that's just like a fact. It's just the way things are. But normally, we don't see it. We don't see this changing nature of things. And instead, things appear to us as if they're solid and unchanging. They stay the same from one moment to the next, from one day to the next, and so on. And so this is a kind of ignorance, you know, that, that doesn't see the impermanent nature of things. And yeah, I mean, it can be quite unsettling to think that everything's changing and we can't stop it. Um, but on the other hand, there's, you know, there's something really wonderful about impermanence because if things were not impermanent, then everything would be like frozen and static. Nothing, nothing could change. And that includes ourselves. We would not be able to change ourselves. We would have to be the way we are forever. And that would be awful. <laughs> I would not like that at all. <laughs> you know, this crazy mind full of afflictions and disturbing thoughts and emotions. I don't want to be like this forever. I want to be a Buddha. And so impermanence means it is possible to change our minds. Um, it's, the, it's the nature of the mind anyway to change, but we can work with our mind and bring about the kind of change that we want to happen, including getting rid of all our afflictive emotions and developing all the realizations and bringing our mind to enlightenment. So actually a permanent, yeah, it, it takes a while to get used to, but, um, but it's incredible, it's wonderful, it's fantastic that, that things are impermanent. 
because that means we can change ourselves and then we can help others to change as well. So yeah, is that helpful? Yes, thank you. Did you have a? Um, with the previous slide where it had the three levels of knowers, um, even though so the, the knower of faces are in Paris, would the would the Buddhists have those in their mind as well? So it's kind of like jumping up a scale where the as you go up, the Bodhisattvas would have the knower of faces in their mind because they needed to know them teach and then um, that makes sense like, as you as you go out like the the solitary here's the solitary, solitary, solitary they only have, they the, only have no or bases buddhists have, have no or bases and, and no or paths and then the buddhists, would have buddhists have all three, three. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 <clears throat> Okay. So, oh, yeah. Two questions. Um, so you said that from the path of seeing onward, bodhisattvas no longer have physical pain. Uh -huh. At what point would bodhisattvas no longer have mental pain? <laughs> At what point did bodhisattvas no longer have mental pain? Um, I can't remember hearing an answer to that. I can try to find something. I mean, the path of like, when they attain the path of seeing, they simultaneously attain the first ground. Mm -hmm. And the first ground is called the very joyful, <laughs> the joyous one, because, you know, they have, yeah, incredible happiness and joy. Um, and I don't know if that means they don't have any unhappiness. Um, I can't be sure. I mean, I would think that by that time in your practice and your development, um, yeah, you'd have gained incredible control over your mind. Your afflictive emotions are not totally gone, but they're very much under control. And, um, and you've been spending all this time, like eons, cultivating love and compassion and all these other wonderful qualities. And they also have, they've also, by that time, they've also attained all the four concentrations, those four um, first concentrations, second concentration. They can go in and out of those anytime they want, and they're really blissful. <laughs> and the four formless absorptions as well. So they can sort of go in and out of these incredible meditative states. So given that, I would think there wouldn't be much mental pain I can't be 100% sure, it's still a long way off for me, but um, yeah, maybe for a split second, <laughs> they feel some mental unhappiness, but they would know how to deal with it, how to take care of that. So yeah, that's just a guess, but I can't be sure. <clears throat> I had one other question. Hmm. Would um, eighth ground bodhisattvas also be free from pervasive compounded suffering? I don't think so, because according to this school, Svatantrika school, um, a bodhisattva doesn't become completely free of afflictions, afflictive obscurations until Buddhahood. So they still have afflictive obscurations all the way through the 10 grounds. And I mean, of course, you know, they're getting more and more cleared away and they just have a tiny bit left just before they become Buddhas. But the fact that they, yeah, there's still afflictions, afflictive obscurations in their mind, um, then maybe for that, for that reason, they would still have pervasive compounded suffering. I'm not 100% sure, because it is different. Like in Prasangika, Prasangika, they say that all the afflictive obscurations have been abandoned by the time they reach the eighth ground. So from the eighth ground on, there's no more afflictive obscurations. And in fact, they're equivalent to an arhat. An eighth, uh, a bodhisattva in the last three grounds, eight, nine, and 10, is uh, equivalent to an arhat. 
there's no, they, yeah, they've abandoned all the afflictive observations. But this school, Svatantuka, has a different explanation. So, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, they don't, but according to this school, a bodhisattva doesn't really become an arhat, a Mahayana arhat, until they're enlightened, until they're a Buddha. Okay, so let's jump into the next chapter, chapter four. And this is um, about the fourth of the um categories or clear realizations called application and complete aspects and chapter four is a very long chapter it's probably the second longest chapter one is definitely the longest mm -hmm. <laughs> chapter four i think is the second longest so it is quite long and a lot of information um so the uh, there's a definition of application and complete aspects um, it's a bodhisattva's yoga conjoined with a wisdom cultivating the aspects of the three exalted knowers. So let's just go through those words. Um, <laughs> so again, application, this is called application and complete aspects. So an application is a practice a uh, kind of meditative practice. It's also called a yoga. And again, this is mental yoga, not hatha yoga. Um, and one explanation of a bodhisattva's yoga is that it's, um, it's either calm abiding or union of calm abiding and special insight. So it's quite a high level of mental development. <clears throat> and the Tibetan term for application is jorwa, and that word can have a number of meanings. One meaning is connect or join, also prepare. So it's often like that with Tibetan. One word can have many different meanings. And so in this case, uh, in the text, it says an application in complete aspects is a method for joining to Buddhahood or preparing for Buddhahood. So it's something that enables us to connect, get connected with Buddhahood and prepare for it, prepare ourselves for Buddhahood. So that's the sort of etymology of application. Um, and so it's a bodhisattva's yoga, and it's conjoined with a wisdom cultivating the aspects of the three exalted knowers. So um, this word aspect has always been difficult for me. <laughs> um, it comes up in different contexts. For example, in Lorig, in the study of mind and awareness, mental factors, and so on, the term aspect comes up. Um, they say that um, objects cast an aspect of themselves to the mind and the mind arises in the aspect of the object. I've always found that very hard to understand. <laughs> um, yeah, but anyway, um, we'll, we'll look a little bit later at the meaning of that term aspect, but there are a total of 173 aspects of the three exalted knowers. And um, <clears throat> so that's the main um, subject in, covered in chapter four is going, listing all those 173 aspects with a little bit of information about each one. So why does a bodhisattva do this? Why does Bodhisattva cultivate the aspects of the three exalted knowers? It's to attain Buddhahood, of course, that's the ultimate goal. And by cultivating all these aspects, they eliminate the obscurations. So they still have the two types of obscurations that need to be eliminated, afflictive obscurations, knowledge obscurations, 
So by meditating on these aspects, 173 aspects, that is the way that they eliminate the um, obscurations that prevent the attainment of enlightenment. <clears throat> um, so, so a bodhisattva needs to learn the hundred and well, I'll, I'll give you a few examples of them later. You're probably curious. What are those 173? Um, we'll look at a few examples. Um, so a bodhisattva needs to learn about them and meditate on them, familiarize with them. And initially, you know, they, they do this kind of one by one, one aspect at a time. But eventually, after a long period of time and a lot of practice, they are able to meditate on all 173 simultaneously. It sounds amazing, but yes, because the mind is impermanent, <laughs> then it's possible to bring about such incredible changes in our mind. <clears throat> multitasking, it's like bodhisattva multitasking. Um, so this application of complete aspects is all along the bodhisattva's path, starting from the path of accumulation all the way up to the end, just before they become enlightened. That's the meaning of that expression, the end of the continuum of a sentient being. That sounds pretty, pretty awful, but it just means <laughs> from, you know, up until that moment, you're still a sentient being. And once you cross over, then you're a Buddha because a Buddha is not a sentient being. <clears throat> um, yeah, so right from the path of accumulation up to Buddhahood, um, that's where this um, application and complete aspects is found. And there are 11 topics um, listed in the next slide. So um, I'll just give a little bit of ex <laughs> a little bit of explanation of each one for now, and then we won't have time to go into all of them, but I'll focus on a few of them and give a bit more details. So the first one is called knower aspects of the antidotal class explicitly indicated in this context. It's a very long title, but basically that is the list of the 173 aspects. So they're all, um, mentioned in the, in the context of that topic. Uh, the second one, second topic is called principal application explicitly indicated in this context. So those are the applications the Bodhisattva uses to, <clears throat> to practice, to meditate on the um, 173 aspects. Then the third is called excellent quality of Mahayana applications. So <clears throat> these are benefits that a bodhisattva gets by cultivating the applications. <clears throat> and number four is called fault of the application. It, does, it doesn't mean fault of the applications literally, but hindrances, um, obstacles that can interfere with developing the applications. <clears throat> and then number five, um, yoga of the path, perfection of wisdom. And that describes the characteristics of the main applications so that we have a better understanding of them. <clears throat> Um, number six, uh, so the term Mahayana partial concordance with liberation, this is another term for the path of accumulation. Um, so I guess in some of the <clears throat> traditional texts, going back to the Indian masters and probably the Buddha as well, that term partial concordance with liberation is a synonym of the path of accumulation. Um, and so that's when the Bodhisattva first starts to practice this application and complete aspects, training themselves in the 173 aspects. And then number seven, 
says Mahayana partial concordance with definite discrimination explicitly indicated in this context. So that term is another term for the path of preparation. The path of preparation is sometimes called the partial concordance with definite discrimination. And there's reasons for that. There's like etymology. I don't have it right here with me, but I can pull it out later. Um, so anyway, number seven is referring to the Mahayana path of preparation. And in this topic, number seven, it's explaining mainly the, the period in between meditative sessions. So there's times when a bodhisattva is in meditation, mainly meditating on emptiness. And then in between their meditation sessions on emptiness, what they do, how they practice. Number eight is called Bodhisattva Sangha, who has attained the sign of irreversibility. So um, there are these signs that indicate when a Bodhisattva has reached a point, a point of no return, I guess you could say. <laughs> Meaning, um, yeah, they're irreversible from attaining enlightenment. So they have developed themselves so well and so far that they are def that definitely they won't go back and they will just keep going to enlightenment. So there's certain signs that indicate that. And each individual bodhisattva would have different signs at different points in time. So that that's explained in the in topic eight. And then number nine is called application of equality of cyclic existence and solitary peace. That's an interesting one. I'll get to that one later. Um, and so this is talking about applications that give rise to a Buddha's truth body, Dharmakaya. <clears throat> number 10 is application of pure land. And so this is talking about applications that give rise to a Buddha's complete enjoyment body or Sambhogakaya, which you probably remember um, is the form of a, of a Buddha in a pure land teaching Arya Bodhisattvas. And the last one, number 11, is called application of skillful means. So these are applications that give rise to a Buddha's emanation body, the Nirmanakaya. So that's the kind of form a Buddha will emanate to help ordinary beings like ourselves. So as you can see, there's a lot of important information in this chapter. We won't have time to go through it all. Um, I, I thought tonight to talk about the 173 aspects, give us a few examples of those. And then among those are the, are the 37 harmonies of, of enlightenment. And I'm gonna mainly focus on those in the next course um, because I think my understanding is that's why Lama Zopa Rinpoche wanted people to study chapter four of the ornament is <laughs> because that's where there's an explanation of the 37 harmonies. So I'm gonna mainly focus on those. and not so much on the other uh, information. Okay, so let's, let's just look at aspects, this term aspect in general. Um, so it says in general, an aspect is an attribute or a feature, it's a general meaning. And then here in the context of chapter four, um, where it talks about these 173 aspects of the three exalted knowers. Um, there are two types of aspects. One are called object aspects. Um, so object aspects are things that we meditate on. They're like the objects of our meditation. For example, the Four Noble Truths. So when we're thinking about or meditating on true sufferings, true origins, true paths, and so on, um, then that's an object aspect. We're looking at that object, those objects, and meditating on them, trying to understand them. And then the, the second one is knower aspects. 
So knower aspects are the minds, the uh, realizations that um, understand and realize those objects like the Four Noble Truths. So for example, the three exalted knowers in the first three chapters, exalted knower of all aspects, knower of paths, knower of bases, those are knower aspects. So they are minds that understand objects like the Four Noble Truths, impermanence, selflessness, emptiness, and so on. So just to take an example, um, impermanence, which is um, one of the objects that need to be meditated on by everybody, hearers and solitary realizers and bodhisattvas. So, um, so when impermanence is the object of meditation, you're meditating on impermanence, then it, impermanence is the object aspect. And then the mind, especially the wisdom, when you actually realize impermanence and you have a wisdom realizing impermanence, then that would be the knower aspect. Um, and so regarding the 173 aspects, there's 173 object aspects. Uh, you know, there, there are 173 objects that are meditated on, and then a corresponding 173 knower aspects, minds, real, they're actually wisdoms, wisdoms that realize those um, aspects. But in, in this chapter, in chapter four, it's mainly uh, focusing on the knower aspects, the wisdoms that are realizing the object aspects. Is that clear? <laughs> um, yeah, so a bodhisattva needs to generate in his or her mind these knower aspects, these 173 knower aspects that understand the 173 object aspects. I know it's complicated language and I didn't write the text. <laughs> there must be, it all came from the Buddha. So there's a reason for explaining it this way. And then there's also this explanation of four ways of meditating on the 173 aspects. So the first is um, generating the mind in the entity of the object. So an example, um, like among the 37 harmonies, the first four are the four close placements of mindfulness. And so when you're meditating on the four close placements of mindfulness, it isn't that you're just thinking, oh, this is what they are, they are like this but you are generating those in your mind. You're generating in your mind a close place, <laughs> close placement of mindfulness of the body, of feelings, of mind and the phenomena, okay? So you're not just looking at them out there, but you are generating them in your mind. Another example would be compassion. You know, when we're meditating on compassion, it shouldn't be just, thinking, oh, compassion is like this, compassion is like that, as if it's something out there. But we are attempting to generate our mind into the entity, into the nature of compassion, generate a compassionate state of mind. So that's one way of meditating. And the second is uh, generating a similitude of the object. And so that means that in some cases, we might be meditating on something that we haven't yet attained. It's, it's a higher level than where we're at. And, but we can still meditate on it and generate a similitude of it. Yeah, like maybe right now we don't have great compassion, but we can still generate a little bit of compassion. <laughs> and then it's like a similitude something similar to great compassion. It helps us understand better what great compassion is. And the third is analyzing the character of the object. So this 
An example is um, if we're thinking about the exalted knower of all aspects, omniscient mind, the omniscient mind of a Buddha. So we can meditate on that and think about what kind of qualities that mind has, um, how the Buddha experiences things and so on. So we're analyzing that object. We're not able to generate it in our mind right now. And even a similitude of it, that's too far away. But we can still analyze it and understand it better. And the fourth one is generating a wish or aspiration. So for example, when if we are meditating on the Buddha's mind, omniscient mind, exalted knower of all aspects and contemplating its qualities and what it would be like to have that kind of mind, then we can generate this strong feeling of wish, aspiration. I want to reach that state. I want to be there. So even before we are actually able to attain certain states of mind or certain realizations or certain qualities, we can still meditate on them in some of these ways, get a better understanding of them and generate the wish or the aspiration to attain them. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so this is looking at topic number one of chapter four, knower aspects of the antidotal class explicitly indicated in this context. Um, so this is in this under this topic um, are the list of the 173 aspects and they are all knower aspects of the antidotal class. And the reason it's called that is clear, if you look at the uh, definition, the definition of this is an exalted knower that is able to overcome its discordant class. So all of these are exalted knowers and the, the, the term exalted knower is another synonym of path and clear realization. So it's a, it's a kind of wisdom and it has, it has the ability to overcome a discordant class. The term discordant class um, ref can refer to, for example, afflictions or wrong views or mistaken states of mind. Um, for example, meditating on impermanence, if we meditate on impermanence, that counteracts or that overcomes the dis discordant class of believing things to be permanent when in fact they're not, okay? So, so there's always some erroneous state of mind that is overcome by meditating on these or generating these uh, different knower aspects. And where it exists is on all paths. <laughs> um, so I think that means all five paths, path of accumulation all the way up to the path of no more learning. I didn't find any clear explanation of that, but it has seemed very open, very extensive. Okay, so here are the 173 divisions broken down into groups. Um, so again, these are 173 aspects of the three exalted knowers. And so each of the three exalted knowers has a certain number of aspects. So first is 27 aspects of knower of bases. And included there are the 16 aspects of the Four Noble Truths. We went, we had a chart of those last time. Uh, so each of the Four Noble Truths has four aspects, like true sufferings has impermanence and suffering and empty and selfless. I can never remember all the others, but I can remember those because those are really important. Anyway, so 16 aspects of the Four Noble Truths. And then there's an additional 11 aspects related to the uh, true paths, the fourth truth. So the true paths has uh, 15. So that's just to give you some idea of what those 27 are. Um, and an example would be the wisdom realizing 
impermanence, the wisdom realizing the impermanence of our aggregates, um, you know, our aggregates of body and mind. So the Bodhisattva will meditate on that and gain the realization that their aggregates are impermanent. And so that wisdom realizing impermanence um, is able to overcome the discordant class of grasping the aggregates as permanent. So we do have that tendency in our mind, that view in our mind that our aggregates are permanent. That's why we get so upset when gray hairs appear and wrinkles appear and you know, our body is getting old and ugly. <laughs> so we're not happy about that. And we wonder why is that happening? Well, if we had the realization of impermanence, we wouldn't be surprised and upset. We just know that's the nature. <laughs> so, so that's just one example of a, of a aspect of knower of bases. The second group, um, 36 aspects of knower of paths. Um, so the first one, the 27 aspects of knower bases, those are found in the minds of all Aryas. So hearers, solitary realizers, bodhisattvas and Buddhas. The second one, the 36 aspects of knower paths are only in the mind of Mahayana Aryas. So Bodhisattva Aryas and Buddha Aryas. And these 36, I'm not gonna go through them, but they are also related to the four noble truths, but different, um, like different aspects related to the four noble truths. So just to give one example, um, one of these, related to true paths is um, the bodhisattva's path of seeing is the aspect of path that gives the opportunity of liberation to all sentient beings. So that would be an object of meditation for bodhisattva, how the path of seeing is an aspect of path that enables all other sentient beings to attain liberation. There's actually not a lot of detailed explanation of all of these in, in, uh, in the text. There are probably other texts. I think there's probably more extensive texts. I heard there's one text by Gyaltsup J. It's probably not been translated into English, but it's more like a practice manual, um, how to practice all the material in the ornament and its commentary. So mainly the ornament and its commentaries is just kind of presenting all these different points, but not really how to meditate on them. But apparently there are other texts like this one by Gelsup J that explains how to meditate on all of these. Okay, then the third group are 110 aspects of exalted knower of all aspects. So these are only in the minds of Buddhas. Um, but there are similitudes, similar uh, realizations in the minds of other Aryas, hearers, solitary realizers, and bodhisattvas. And there is subdivisions of these 110 aspects. Um, the first group is the 37 aspects similar to those of hearers. So that's the 37 harmonies. <laughs> So we, when, whenever we take the Mahayana precepts in the, in the prayer of taking the Mahayana precepts, it mentions the 37 harmonies. So yeah, like I say, in the next, um, next course, starting in September, I will go through those. We may not have time to go into detail with all of them, but at least um, some of them, because they are very important. So, um, so these, these are aspects similar to those of hearers. So what that means is that hearers, um, hearers meditate on these and cultivate these, but so do bodhisattvas, so do solitary realizers. So all types of aryas uh, do meditate on those 37 harmonies um, and cultivate them. And then Buddhas, a Buddha has sort of the 
full culmination of those 37 aspects. So Buddhas have the main ones, but the other practitioners have similar aspects to them. <clears throat> And then um, <clears throat> the second group are 34 aspects similar to those of bodhisattvas. And so again, the main ones are in the minds of Buddhas, but bodhisattvas have similar uh, wisdom, similar exalted knowers in their minds. So just to give an example of the 34, one, uh, one group is the 10, it's called the 10 paths of Buddhas, and this refers to the 10 perfections. So the usual six perfections that we're all familiar with, plus another four perfections that are said to be kind of included in the sixth perfection, the perfection of wisdom. But anyway, the 10 perfections, um, are called the 10 paths of Buddhas. And according to this school, according to Svatantrika, the 10 perfections only exist in the mind of a Buddha. Um, the perfection of generosity, for example, is only in the mind of a Buddha. But bodhisattvas have a similitude. They have a similar practice. You know, they are working towards the perfection of generosity, but they're not yet, it's not yet perfect. <laughs> so only at Buddhahood are they perfect, um, but bodhisattvas are practicing them. So those, so those are included in that second group of 34 aspects similar to those of bodhisattvas. And then the last group are the 39 aspects that are uncommon. And what that means is they are only in the mind of a Buddha. Only Buddhas have those, and they're not shared with hearers or solitary. Not that the Buddha doesn't want to share them, but <laughs> hearers and solitary realizers and bodhisattvas just aren't there yet. They haven't yet um, um, attained those. Um, so I thought to go through a few of those. Um, so these 39 aspects are uh, qualities of Buddhas, and so among them are the, what are called the 10 strengths of a Buddha. Sometimes they're also translated as powers, but I think strength is a more accurate translation of the term. And these are found in the Sanskrit sutras as well as the Pali sutras. So they're in all the traditions of Buddhas, uh, Buddhism. And, um, all of them are wisdoms, Buddha's wisdom. Um, and they have abandoned all obscurations or free of all obscurations. And they're also om omniscient. They know all phenomena. But, you know, they're still described as knowing certain specific phenomena. And so a Buddha... Any Buddha, all Buddhas have these 10 uh, strengths and they enable the Buddha to perform the special functions of a Buddha, like uh, proclaiming his lion's roar. There's that, ex that expression of the Buddha's teachings being like the lion's roar, just very powerful and um, surpassing all other sounds, <laughs> all other teachings and to establish Buddhas, Buddhism in the world and teach sentient beings and lead them to awakening. So Buddha is able to do all of, all of those things because of having these 10 strengths. So I'll just give a little explanation of them. Um, so the first, so each of them involves knowing or understanding certain phenomena. So the first one is called sources and non-sources. And this, means knowing that virtue, you know, virtue, positive, constructive behavior is the source of happiness, good experiences. And, um, and it's not the source of unhappiness. <laughs> so 
sources and non-sources. You know, this is a source of happiness, but it's non, it's a non-source of suffering. It's not the source of suffering. So that's what that means. And the second is knowing the fruition of action. So this is um, about karma, knowing all the details of karma, uh, cause and effect. The Buddha is able to directly see even the, the specific um, kinds of actions or karma that are the cause of specific results, experiences, both good and bad. I know it seems a little bit like the first one. Uh, the first two, I'm not 100% sure how they differ, but there must be a difference there. But basically, they're about knowing, you know, what kind of causes bring what kind of results. Third is called the variety of interests. And so this means the Buddha knows um, different interests of sentient beings. Some are interested more in getting good rebirths in samsara. Others are interested in getting out of samsara, getting to liberation. Others are interested in enlightenment. And so Buddha is able to know um, how sentient beings are, are different, how they have these different interests. And in that way, he is able to guide them according to their interests and inclinations. And number four is the many classes in the world system. So one explanation of this is knowing all the different realms of existence, knowing different elements, constituents, so different kinds of phenomena within the world, the universe. And then fifth is superior and inferior faculties. So this refers to being, sentient beings. And uh, faculties depend on um, the strength of five powers. Um, so there are these five powers that are developed along the path. They're included in uh, 37 Harmonies of Enlightenment. Faith joyous effort, mindfulness, uh, meditative stabilization, and wisdom. So those are five powers that one needs to develop along the path. So depending on uh, whether those are strong or weak in sentient beings, that would determine whether they have uh, superior or inferior faculty. So Buddha is able to know, he's able to see where beings are at in terms of those powers and is able to guide them accordingly. Number six, paths that proceed everywhere. Um, so this can include paths that lead to higher rebirths, different kinds of rebirths in samsara or to liberation, to enlightenment. So the Buddha's, Buddha knows all those different paths. <clears throat> Number seven, um, knowing the thoroughly afflicted and the completely pure. Um, so sometimes those terms refer to, you know, whatever is afflicted and whatever is pure. But here it seems to refer to a specific uh, things that are afflicted and pure in relation to meditative absorptions, concentrations. So, for example, um, thoroughly afflicted refers to having attachment to uh, various levels of concentration. So as you develop for first concentration, second concentration, and so on, these meditative states, then you can get attached to them. And that's a hindrance. That's an obstacle to progressing further. And you might even fall. You might even lose those. So... That's the meaning of thoroughly afflicted. And then completely pure refers to being free of that kind of attachment. So it has to do with meditative stabilization. And then number eight is um, remembering former states. So Buddha 
is able to remember all his own previous lives going back <laughs> I mean, as far as possible. Um, so this is something that happened in the story of the Buddha's enlightenment as he was meditating under the Bodhi tree. Um, that last night, um, just before he attained enlightenment, then these memories all came up of his former lives, um, knowing he was this and that and here and there and did this and that and so on. The Buddha has that ability. And then number nine is death, transference, and rebirth. So this has to do with other beings. So Buddha is also able to see other sentient beings dying and taking rebirth, going from one place to another place, one kind of form to another form, and so on, according to their karma. So Buddha is also able to see the karmic causes for a being to take certain births. And then number 10 is the exhaustion of contamination. So this means a Buddha has the knowledge that they have completely eliminated all obscurations, all the afflictive obscurations, all the knowledge of obscurations. So every single stain or contamination is totally gone in their mind. Um, so these qualities exist only in a Buddha, um, but still a Bodhisattva needs to meditate on them, probably in terms of analyzing them, understanding what they are, and um, generating the aspiration to attain them, and of course, creating the causes to attain them doing all the practices they need to do to attain these. Yeah, so um, I also thought you might be interested in knowing some of the other qualities of Buddha. Um, so the next, um, next slide shows, again, these are included in the 39 aspects um, of an exalted number of aspects. These are called the four fearlessnesses of a Buddha. Um, so what these mean is that a Buddha has no fear, no anxiety, and is totally confident to be able to make these statements or make these proclamations even in the midst of a large crowd of people. So he's totally confident in these things. Um, the first one is fearlessness with regard to perfect realizations. So a Buddha can confidently say, I am clearly and completely enlightened in all ways with respect to all phenomena. And he's not boasting. He's just telling it like it is. That's, that's the truth. That's the fact. His mind is, is in that state. So he's able to say that with full confidence. And the second is fearlessness regarding um, perfect abandonment. So again, a Buddha is able to make the statement, I have completely abandoned all obscurations, all stains without exception. And he can say that with complete confidence because it's true. There's not the slightest obscuration or stain in his mind. And they have been abandoned such that they will never return, they will never arise again. And then the third is fearlessness regarding indicating hindering phenomena. So hindering phenomena refer to obscurations that prevent liberation and enlightenment. So a Buddha is able to confidently explain to people what they have in their minds that are preventing them from attaining those states and keeping them in samsara, keeping them in a state of suffering. So Buddha is able to explain what they need to overcome, what they need to abandon in order to attain those higher states. 
And the fourth is fearlessness regarding teaching the path of definite emergence. And so Buddha, again, is fearless, confident about presenting the, <clears throat> the path, what it is one needs to do in order to overcome the obscurations, the hindrances, how to overcome the afflictions how to overcome the um, knowledge obscurations. So Buddha is able to explain that with full confidence. So I was thinking how, you know, um, there are people who seem to be fearless and full of confidence in proclaiming things that are absolute lies. <laughs> in front of millions of people <laughs> we you probably know who i'm talking about here but no there's lots there's lots of cases of that you know people who just tell absolute lies and they seem to have no <laughs> shame no uh, doubt no no lack of confidence in that so um so we may wonder well, what's the difference between somebody like that and somebody like the buddha and standing up and and you know and saying, I am fully enlightened and I have, well, I mean, there is a difference in that one is a lie and one is the truth. It's hard for us to know for sure. You know, unfortunately, you know, a lot of people believe in the lies that are told there. They have absolute confidence that this is the truth, even though it's a complete lie. So we do need to develop our own wisdom, our own discriminating wisdom. As the Buddha said, you know, don't just believe what I say, but check it out, investigate for yourself. So we are meant to do that. We are meant to check the Buddha's teachings and see if they're true or not. And that involves practicing, trying out the methods that he explains and see if they work, if they do help to decrease our suffering, decrease our afflictions, or do they make us have more suffering and more affliction. So we do need to try them out and to investigate them, use logic and reasoning and so on. So in that way, we can know, <laughs> we can know if the Buddha is telling the truth or if he's just bragging and boasting and saying things that aren't true. But from the Buddha's side, from his point of view, he is just speaking according to what is reality, you know, that he has these experiences, this knowledge, uh, this abandonment knows these methods and so on. Okay, so that's probably enough for today. <laughs> I prepared a few more, but we can leave them for next week. So yeah, so in general, that gives you hopefully some idea of these 173 aspects. When we were studying um, in the you know, during the master's program, we had this great big chart <laughs> mm -hmm. showing all 173 aspects. And we memorized them, at least I did. Mm -hmm. Memorized every single one of them because that was on the exam. <laughs> if you wanted to pass the exam, you had, to, you had to do that. So it's useful. I mean, I've forgotten most of it now, but at least having done it once or twice, there's probably some imprint left in the mind and it would make it easier to do that again, you know, to memorize those again. So again, um, yeah, these are um, things that a bodhisattva, and if we aspire to be bodhisattvas and follow the path, we need to do this as well at some point, um, to learn all these um, different aspects, um, study them, meditate on them, and gain um, a realization, wisdom realizing these these different aspects and they are all for the purpose of overcoming some kind of fault or affliction or misconception erroneous states of mind that keep us in samsara and are the cause of suffering so they're for our benefit to be able to do this any questions before we finish <clears throat> no questions in the in the chat, but Rashika has a interesting comment. Those roars, I guess, is the right term, are listed and des 
described in Venerable Children's book, One Teacher, Many Traditions. Which one are described? The ten. Oh, the 10. Yeah, yeah. They're also in um, volume four, um, following in the Buddhist footsteps. So in that, it's a very extensive explanation of the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, going into great details about the different qualities of the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha. So yeah, those 10 are mentioned there as well. And the four fearlessnesses. <clears throat> they also came up recently in the Friday night teaching, didn't they? Yeah. In relation to that. Um, is it the Ye Dharma Mantra? Ye Dharma Dharani? Mm -hmm. Correlation between, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the four truths, yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, let's conclude by dedicating the merit, the positive energy we created, spending this time together, starting off with um, positive altruistic motivation, wanting to benefit all sentient beings, and then listening, even though the material may be difficult, um, a lot of details that we don't fully understand, but it's still beneficial to get the imprints of this information on our minds, having those imprints will make it easier for us in the future to meet the teachings and um, be in a better position to fully study them, and meditate on them and actually develop the realizations. So feel confident we have created merit, positive energy during this time. Rejoice that we spend our time in this way and then dedicate this positive energy, share it with all other sentient beings, wishing that it will benefit them, help them be free of suffering, help them reach enlightenment as well. And also remember emptiness, that oneself who created the merit and is now dedicating it <clears throat> doesn't exist inherently independently from its own side. And the merit we created is also empty of existing inherently from its own side. And the goal to which we are dedicating enlightenment for all sinning beings is also empty of existing inherently independently from its own side. <clears throat> Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, May I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the Supreme Jewel Bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but it increase more and more. Incomparably kind and supreme Tenzin Gyatso, the wish-fulfilling, wish-granting jewel, source of every benefit and happiness in the world. May you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjunath's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three sublime ones, Savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.